Okay, uh, Dr. James White and A.D. Robles, a uh, little bit of back and forth there between these two. Uh, I think the issue was the Crusades, and um, I think I think what A.D. I, I want to be is I want to be charitable here and say I think what A.D. is was talking about with respect to the Crusades was simply the enthusiasm, you know, the the purpose principle. You know, younger Christian men are looking for purpose in their Christian faith. How do I, you know, take my Christian faith to the world? Which is a good thing. That's a good enthusiasm. But what Dr. James would be uh, cautioning against is making sure you have proper theology backing up your apologetics ministries. Okay, making sure you have proper theology before you go start trying to take this message to the world. And in order to do that, you need to know something about church history and historical theology and then systematic theology uh, being the queen of the sciences. You know, I remember hearing that for the first time. Systematic theology is the queen of the sciences. Well, systematic theology, biblically derived, is the queen of the sciences. It's the highest science, the highest knowledge we can ever study is systematic theology, biblically derived derived. And that's important. It really is. And I think AD is sort of downplaying the importance of that. I think that's what James is getting a little bit frustrated with. Uh, I would be frustrated too. But here, let's listen to just this, uh, this clip here of an example of why these issues are important. And but the bigger issue, of course, is I think both the it, all three of us are Reformed Baptists. Okay, we're Baptists and we're Reformed. We're Calvinist Baptists. Uh, all three of us are. But here's the bigger problem: is the high partial preterism coupled with postmillennialism? That's the bigger problem, and that is a theological issue that Dr. James says is very important. I agree with him. That is an important issue. Uh, but let's listen to one of the problems here that is going to arise, and that is definitions of terms. What is sacralism? When James talks about sacralism, what is he talking about? And A.D.'s response is not appropriate. It's not the way we should be responding to when, uh, you know, an erudite scholar like Dr. James White talks about sacralism. Uh, we have to understand what he's talking about. Okay, so let's listen. He can say whatever he wants. He can't, he, he, he doesn't affect my mood. I could still love him right back. As simple as that. But uh, I'm not going to get distracted by that. There's that 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 video has all of its own stuff in it. I uh, by the way, I love you too. I love you guys. No question about it. You're my brothers in Christ. That's that's just what it is. Uh, Dr. James White was pivotal, pivotal in uh, bringing me to the Reformed faith, historically, biblically. John Calvin's Institutes of Christian Religion, there's a reason why the ink of Calvin's Institutes still smudges, and I know what Dr. James White means by that when he has said that before. Uh, so the ink of Dr. John Gill's writings still smudges too. The ink of uh, Jonathan Edwards' writings still smudges too. They're, they're still as relevant today as when they were first written. It is amazing. Uh, I can read Hippolytus of Rome or Tertullian and the ink still smudges to this day. Yeah, they had some issues here and there. We get it. There are theological issues and those are important. But some of the stuff they said was just like mind-blowing that our Christian brethren have been promulgating these same messages over in almost two millennia. In, in 2030, it'll be the 2000th year uh, anniversary of the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ in 2030, okay? Because I believe the crucifixion is placed in 30 AD. I think that's the best date for the crucifixion. Uh, and I have a book on that too uh, in my library there by Stein, and I forget his name, uh, Jesus the Messiah. Anyway, 30 AD I think is the best date for the crucifixion. Um, but... What else am I going to say? Okay, let's go on with the clip here. I reference it uh, throughout this uh, response, but we're just going to power through and continue on with this one. 
and um, yeah, and then there you go. So that's what we're gonna do. That is what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're just let, you know what? Let's just do it. The essence of sacralism, crying out loud. The essence of so. I guess hold on. Why some of these? I'm missing something. Hold on, hold on. Let's just double check here to make sure I'm I'm not fast forwarded here. Hold on, let's try it. But you're doing it with a cross on your shield. Yes, yes, okay, yeah. This is the very essence of sacralism, crying out loud. The essence. I think it's one of the, why some of these Christian nationalist guys that are big Steve Wolf, uh, Stephen Wolf fans um, don't have any problem with this because he's a full-blown sacralist. <laughs> a full-blown full sacralist. I mean... I mean, is that ridiculous to say that? I mean, that's a bold assertion, right? But when Dr. James White says a bold assertion like that, and he says it's full-blown sacralism, well, I want to know what he's talking about. What do, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And so I might have to look up some of these words <laughs> in what he's saying. But here's AD's response. Listen, I, I, I'm being straight up with you. I really don't know what sacralism is, and I personally don't care. Um, but, but, but I'll tell you. Well, well <laughs> what? You don't know what it is, and you personally don't care. But your reaction was to see to 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 seem to indicate that Dr. James was being absurd in his assertion of this full blown sacralism thing. But then, so it's absurd for him to say that. But then, uh, I don't know what sacralism is, and I don't care. Well, that's the pro that's a problem. <laughs> you you know. You have to know what these words mean and what he's referring to here. But listen to this. Listen to this. It's that I know it's a scare term. It's it's definitely one of those terms that I'm not saying it started this way, but it's become this thing that you say when you want someone to be really scared of what's going to happen. Full, not just a sacralist. Listen. He is a full blown sacralist. Well, okay. Whether that was. James intention or not is irrelevant to the issue. Well, maybe it is relevant to the issue, but if you're saying it's a scare tactic, well then you might want to know what the word means and what he's referring to. I mean, you know, first of all, when Dr. James said sa like he's a preterist, you're a preterist, post-millennialist, post-millennialism, I refute both of those. Those are both fa fallacious. So, but I know when Dr. James says something like this, I at least want to know what he's talking about. And he deserves at least that respect to understand his mindset here. So sacralism. And this is just Wikipedia. Sacralism is the confluence of church and state wherein one is called upon to change the other. It also denotes a perspective that views church and state as tied together instead of separate entities. So the one, sacralism, would be church and state tied together, whereas the other perspective, non-sacralism, would see it appropriate to view the church and state as separate entities. But if you view the church and state as tied together, sacralism, uh, so that people within a geographical and political region or nation are considered members of the dominant ecclesiastical institution. Okay, now you can see why maybe Stephen Wolfe's Presbyterianism is influencing his, what Dr. James White calls, uh, full-blown sacralism. You can, whereas Reformed Baptists, we don't have the same church polity as Presbyterians. Okay, Presbyterians, and look at Dr. James White wrote, uh, contributed to a book called Four Views of Church Polity. Now, James White had the only accurate view in that book, but the primary debate, even James White will say, was a, was between himself and Dr. Robert L. Raymond. Dr. Robert L. Raymond, a man who we both have the utmost love and respect for, Dr. Robert L. Raymond. I have quoted from Raymond. Uh, Raymond's New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith has so many gems in there that are just, you know, gold, precious stones, 
uh, gems of God's truth in that systematic theology, but we have disagreements, one of which is on church polity. And uh, this becomes an issue now with Stephen Wolf, the issue of church and state enmeshment, the enmeshment of church and state, whereas Baptists, we should all be like, yeah, no, <laughs> we're very cautious about the enmeshment of church and state. We've been there, done that, got the t-shirt in Baptist history. We don't like it. We want the state to keep its dirty, grimy, grubby, satanic hands off of our worship and off of our theology. We don't want the state determining our theology for us. As Baptists, we should all agree with that. So a full-blown sacralism would be an enmeshment of church and state. That people within a geographical or political region are considered members of the dominant ecclesiastical institution. That's a problem. So Stephen Wolf might come at with, with, the, with this debate, uh, debate challenge, I guess, to Dr. James White. Stephen Wolf said, "I will. He'll be defending the Reformation, as if Dr. James White hasn't been defending the Reformation." But I can also see where Stephen Wolf is coming from, and that is he might be coming from the issue of oh, I don't know, Reformations and revolt in the Netherlands, fifteen hundred to sixteen twenty one. This is just one example. There was an enmeshment between church and state so much so that you couldn't be of another. Uh, you couldn't be a papist, for example, and be a part of the Netherlands. That was one of the issues. Uh, the Protest and, and the repression, also fierce repression, of uh, Protestant heresies by the Reformed churches. Uh, protests against the latter Protestant heresies helped to trigger the revolt that res resulted in the split of the Habsburg Netherlands. In the Northern Netherlands, the Dutch Republic gave the Reformed Church a monopoly of worship, but also guaranteed freedom of conscience to its dissidents. Well, what about, well, freedom of conscience is one thing, but, but what about their freedom of worship? Okay, even if you're a papist, antichrist papal church worship, do they still have a right to worship? Or only in their consciences can they think about it? The Southern Netherlands, once reconciled with the Habsburgs and having expelled its Protestant inhabitants, became a bulwark of the Counter-Reformation, led by the Jesuits. Uh, for more on the revolt, Oxford Bibliographies. Okay, so when Stephen Wolfe says he wants to defend the Reformation against James White, and James White's like, what are you talking about? Been defending the Reformation for... 40 years, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I think that's what Stephen Wolf is talking about. He wants to defend even in reformed history amongst certain nations in Europe, the idea of church and state enmeshment. And that's what James might have to argue against, right? Church and state enmeshment. But we don't want to be dismissive when Dr. James White says something about sacralism and says it in pretty pretty forceful language. We want to pay attention to what he's saying here and at least have look up definitions of terms. We don't want to, I don't know what that is and I don't care. <laughs> That's not going to do anybody any good. These are theological issues that James White is very concerned with and his concern is 100% Valid. Valid. His concerns are valid. And I submit to you that with Stephen Wolf, it comes from, um, again, it stems from a post-millennialism. I don't have to worry. I'm a pre-millennialist. So uh, a heavenly kingdom pre-millennialist. The millennial reign of Christ and his saints will not take place on the earth. It will take place in heaven. The earth will be void and desolate of all life except for Satan and his angels imprisoned, bound by a chain of circumstances uh, for a thousand years on a desolate earth with no one to inhabit, no one to tempt, no one to lie, to lie to, uh, all that for a thousand year prison term. Uh, and then st stuff happens after the millennium. 
but so I'm not a post millennialist and I'm not a high partial uh, partial preterist either in any way, shape or form. Neither was the Reformation. Uh, I can defend the Reformation's view on eschatology against all you preterists, all of you. I'd line up all of you, all you preterists, Kenneth L. Gentry, uh, A.D. Robles, if he's a preterist, which I think he is, pretty sure he is. Uh, James White, I'm pretty sure he's a preterist too. Uh, but I would line up Kenneth L. Gentry, Jeff Durbin, Zach Luke over at Apologia. I would line them all up and say, I'll take all of you on with this preterist nonsense. All of you, all at the same time. Not just one-on-one, -on -one, all of you at the same time. Because then you will hear the truth. And then if you go away from that debate, as mumble-mouthed as I may be, if you go away from that debate still thinking that preterism is true, that's not on me. That's not on me. That's on you for turning your back on the truth. So anyway, back and forth. Uh, love you both. Uh, I get frustrated with the high partial preterists slash post millennialists, and now this is coming into the sphere of you know quote Christian nationalism. Well, I can tell you right now, I don't want the state enforcing any worship on me as a Christian or any theology. It can't impose any theology on me. However, the church can most certainly get involved in the state. Here's where it is: it is lawful for Christians. Uh, paragraph two, sixteen eighty nine Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter twenty four. And it is of the civil magistrate. The uh, power of the sword of the state uh, to for the encouragement of them that do good and for the punishment of evildoers. The punishment of evildoers. Dr. James White will remember this. Remember when George Walker Bush started talking about you know, we need to go after the evildoers. And, and people on the left-wing media just thought it was absurdly ridiculous and, and mocked it and said, oh, he used the term evildoers. Who uses that term anymore? Uh, arrogant. Arrogant as they are. As if the term evildoers isn't a biblical term and confessional term, too, for the punishment of evildoers. Paragraph 2, it is lawful for Christians to accept and execute the office of a magistrate. That is to take up uh, offices in the state, local governments, or the federal government. When called thereunto, in the management whereof, as they ought especially, to maintain justice and peace. Was that the purpose of the Crusades? <laughs> to maintain justice and peace? I think Dr. James White would agree with me. Uh, if he said, if I said no, it was not to maintain justice and peace. And there was a false theology behind the whole thing. Anyway, here's Philip Schaff. Here's Philip Schaff. The, uh, this is, uh, history of the Christian church, volume five, volume five. And he's got, uh, middle ages, Hildebrandium popes, then a whole section on the crusades. There was a children's crusade, very sad, very sad. There were children throughout Europe who were, we're going to go on crusade too, and enthusiasm and all this, all based on falsehoods, errors, and lies from the papal antichrist, the scarlet harlot herself. And so character and causes of the crusades, volume five, history of the Christian church, uh, Philip Schaff. The crusades were armed pilgrimages to Jerusalem and under the banner of the cross. Now, why to Jerusalem? I mean, aren't we told in Scripture that Christians are members of the Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem that is above, that is the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem? Not the, what, what's, what's the issue with earthly Jerusalem at this time? Who cares? Right? Where two or three are gathered in the name of Christ, there too Christ is. Jerusalem has nothing to do with it. Well, we go further back in church history and we start to talk about relics. Relics. When did the, the veneration or at least some sort of uh, exaltation of relics begin to take place? Eh, a few hundred years earlier. This was all f false doctrine that crept in slowly but surely. As Jonathan Edwards said, the apostasy of the church, the professing Christian church, 
after the fall of the Roman Empire, and even before the fall of the Roman Empire, but especially after, when the Antichrist arose, uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, Jonathan Edwards would say, as an historicist, because he was not a preterist, uh, he said the 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 apostasy was gradual. The rise of the little horn of Daniel chapter seven was gradual. Uh, didn't happen in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day. Rome didn't fall in a day. Papal Rome wasn't built in a day, and it didn't fall in a day. Um, and it's still with us all the way up until the second advent. In Second Thessalonians chapter two verse eight, the man of sin, son of perdition, will continue all the way up until the coming of Christ. But uh, the Christian church corrupted itself, said Jonathan Edwards. That's the apostasy of Second Thessalonians chapter two. The Christian church corrupted itself, and this was one of the results: was the Crusades, pilgrimages to Jerusalem. They exhibit the, and here's what A. D. Robles. Or Robles, I think his name is pronounced Robles. I want to get that right. My last name, by the way, is Gallmeyer, not Galmier, Gallmeyer. Very German, got to think German. Uh, but the Crusades exhibit the muscular Christianity of the new nations of the West, which were just emerging from barbarism and heathenism. Just emerging from barbarism and heathenism to what? an apostate Christianity at this time, an apostate Christianity. They were a succession of tournaments between two continents and two religions struggling for supremacy. Europe and Asia, Christianity and Mohammedanism. Mohammedanism would be Islam, okay? That's how they used to, that's how they used to describe Islam, Mohammedanism. But it really wasn't against between Christianity and Mohammedanism the Christianity of the day that called itself Christianity, but remember, it was an apostate Christianity, a papal Christianity. These expeditions occupied the attention of Europe for more than two centuries. They continued to be the concern of the popes. Sacralism, church and state, and meshed together, dominant ecclesiastical institution. And until the beginning of the 16th century, Emperors and kings went at the head of the armies, but if some of the best men of Europe and those most eminent in station went on the Crusades, so also did the lowest elements of European society, namely thieves, murderers, perjurers, vagabonds, and scoundrels of all sorts. Why did they do it? Why did they do it? Because they were prom promised absolution. They were called... Soldiers of Christ, or it was called taking the sign of the cross to go on crusade. Those who fell under eastern skies or on their way to the east received the benefits of special indulgences for sins committed and were esteemed in the popular judgment that is in their mindset, in their thinking, right? The social media of the day would call these people martyrs. And they would get indulgences for sins for going on crusade. All this is false theology. And that is what Dr. James White's point continues to be. And if A.D. Robles doesn't want to look at those theological issues, well, those are important issues. They are. It doesn't do us any good to say, I don't know. It's a scare tactic that he's using this. And I don't know what it means, and I don't care. Well, that's that's not going to do anybody any good. You know, why are you even making a video in response to this if you're not actually going to do the work? And, and this doesn't take a lot of work. It's just Wikipedia. <laughs> now, there is a, a bibliographical information, Henry Hudson, Spiritual Development Growing Gracefully. I don't know who Henry Hudson is. Uh, I didn't look him up. I could have, but I, I probably should have. But... I don't see this as a false definition, confluence of church and state. And again, if we go to scripture, let's go to um, Revelation chapter 17, the great prostitute and the beast, the great prostitute being papal Rome, and the beast sitting on the remnants of the Roman Empire, 
I will show you the judgment of a great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth, kings of the earth, have committed fornication. I'm going to use the word fornication because I think it's a more powerful term. It means the same thing as it does in the ESV. It just, I think it's a little bit more uh, pointed. They've committed fornication with the great prostitute, the kings of the earth have. And with, and with the wine, with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. Well, what is the wine of her fornication, of fornicating with her? False doctrine, false theology, which is what Dr. James White is the most concerned with. And I am too. And I think he's absolutely right. Okay to think theologically about these things. Systematic theology, the queen of the sciences. Dr. James White's first doctorate, he's got like three doctorates now, uh, or at least he was working on a PhD. Uh, he didn't have a PhD before. He had a THD, a doctorate of theology, and a doctorate of ministry. So two doctorates, and then he was working on his PhD, and I don't know how far along he is in that work, if that's complete or what. So it's like three doctorates. But his first doctorate was a THD, Doctorate of Theology. And uh, so the theological issues are important. And what was I talking about? Philip Schaff. No, 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 Revelation 17. Oh, my goodness. So the woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast full of blasphemous names, seven heads, ten horns, the woman uh, going back to Daniel chapter 7. The woman arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. Babylon the great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. False doctrine. That is the wine of her fornication. False doctrine. And it influenced, obviously, the Crusades. And that is what Dr. James is talking about. And A.D. Robles wants to simply talk about the Crusades as being enthusiastic. <laughs> okay, But I think what Dr. James White is saying is that, well, being enthusiastic, fine. But you need to have a proper foundation. And that is the whole of systematic theology. Before you start engaging in these kinds of, of things. So... That's my take on it. Uh, uh, Dr. James and Stephen Wolf, uh, again, he's going to talk, it's sacralism. So he's, Stephen Wolf's going to talk about the sacralism of the Reformation and saying, well, they were still church, state, and meshment even in the Reformation. But now, since it was reformed, uh, it was a better church, state, and meshment than the papal. Uh, papal Europe. Uh, and I think as Baptists, we should be like, mm, yeah, no, no. We we like our Bill of Rights, and our Bill of Rights says the state can keep its dirty, grimy, grubby hands off our worship and our theology. <laughs> so let me know what you think in the comments down below. We'll talk to you soon. Lord willing, Soli Deo Gloria.